to reiterate that uh, the definition does include the appropriate clinical setting, so either a clinical history or an ECG or something that would make you think this is myocardial ischemia and, and not some other diagnosis like sepsis because um, certainly in sepsis or pulmonary embolism or congestive heart failure, the troponin can be elevated and it's not, it doesn't fit the definition of acute myocardial infarction. Vipin, I think, sort of also highlighted that this is really a big paradigm shift for our clinical practice because the high sensitivity test measured in nanograms can now be detected in healthy individuals. We're very used to the idea that if the troponin is negative, that you know, we sort of will rule them out. Um, but that's not the case anymore because many people will have positive troponin, so-called, um, above the level of, of sensitivity. Um, so um, the big seesaw that uh, Vipin highlighted as well, sensitivity versus specificity. Um, uh, obviously, as you increase the sensitivity, the specificity must go down. Um, and I just wrote a little quote here. It says, in our quest to detect everyone with a disease, that is to pick up the true positives, using an ever more increasing sensitive test, we must recognize that we will classify more non-diseased patients as having the disease. So these are the false positives. And this is the trade-off that we have to sort of accept and, and learn to live with. And uh, the algorithm that uh, Vipin presented, I'll present at the end and we'll have some discussion about that, is an attempt to try and live with that trade-off. I wanted to uh, briefly go through this paper. I sent, I think, most of you several papers. I think this one's important and it highlights kind of the practical issue that will be faced. Um, this was just published in September. Um, it uh, took place, the study, in Manchester at a large uh, academic facility, 145,000 census. They looked at sort of the typical kind of patients that we would see, um, chest pain less than 24 hours, consistent with a cardiac cause of their chest pain. It actually was a prospective study um, that was looking at a whole bunch of other early markers, but they did run high sensitivity troponin as one of those markers. And this is an important point that the measurement they took was on the blood that was drawn at ED presentation. So this is the first draw, not a repeat. This is the very first draw at presentation. And the outcome they were looking at was a diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. The people who were determining that outcome did not have the high sensitivity troponin. So they were blinded to what the high sensitivity troponin was when they decided whether a patient had an MI or not. There are 703 patients. Uh, they actually had nobody lost to follow up, which is amazing, and they did six month follow up in these patients to see if any of them suffered any adverse effects. Um, the baseline patient characteristics were consistent with a high risk population, which I'll show you because it's, it's an important point here. If you look at that red bracket, if you just kind of look at that, 30% of them had previous angina, uh, half of them were hypertensive. 20% had diabetes. I mean, this is a high-risk population. I think this is consistent with the type of patients that we would be ordering troponins on. The other thing which I thought was very interesting in this large sample is the only thing that was different between the AMI patients and those who turned out not to have an AMI was they were a little bit older by about six years and their smoking history. All the other features that we always look to, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, diabetes, there was no difference between the people who ruled in and ruled out. I thought it was a very interesting point. The other thing I want to point out is the green arrow at the bottom. Time from onset of symptoms to this blood draw, um, about 60% of them were less than three hours. So I think maybe even a higher percentage than we see early on, early presenters. Um, and that's an important point, and I think uh, Bork was sort of addressing that issue. The median time from symptom onset to the draw was three and a half hours. Um, this population ruled in for an acute MI in 18%. I think it's relatively high, actually. I think probably higher than our population would be my guess. Um, the, the, the sort of highlight result is that no patient with a troponin less than three at the time of ED presentation had an AMI. So it was 100% sensitive. Fairly large sample, 700 patients, so the confidence interval around that 100% goes down to 97. So sensitivity for AMI remained 100% even for people who presented within three hours. So if you just looked at the, 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 those people who presented within three hours of the onset of symptoms, it was still 100% sensitive in their population. 
as you would expect from the seesaw, the specificity was very poor for if you use three as your cutoff. The specificity was only 34% for an MI, which highlights what Vipin was trying to say is you can't take a positive troponin and say, oh, they must be an MI, because most of them, in fact, will not be an MI, even though you can measure, both some, you can measure some troponin. I want to spend some time on this slide, because this is really the nuts and bolts of the whole study. <coughs> you can see they had 703 patients. There were 100 excluded, but if you look at that list of exclusions, 93 were excluded because they didn't have a sample in the lab to run it. So, you know, that's a very reasonable thing. There were very few other exclusions. Um, you know, two people in dialysis who got into the trial by mistake. Um, really just to demonstrate, I think it's a reasonable population of patients to look at. And we looked at the baseline characteristics and they look like, again, a reasonable set of patients that we might be seeing. No, nobody lost a follow-up. So 28% of these patients who had chest pain had symptoms compatible with cardiac cause. We were worried about them. 28% of them were less than three. On their first draw, none of them had an MI. So some people have used this paper to say, get their troponin when they present. If it's less than three, you're done. They do not have an MI. This, the confidence interval around that is 97 to 100. So you know, statistically, there is a chance that somebody might have an MI. Um, but in another paper, I think the Reichler paper from New England Journal had sort of a similar result. If it's less than the detectable lower limit, which I'm not sure if we're using three or five Vipin. We're going to use three here as well, same as in this paper. Uh, if it's less than three, it's very, very unlikely they have an MI. If you're in that sort of uh, greater than 14, so the 99% cutoff, if they're greater than that, and that'll be about 30% of our patients, according to this study, about half of them turn out to have an MI. But half of them don't have an MI. They have some other cause for their troponin elevation. And in that 3 to 14 range, which is almost half of the patients, very few of them had an MI, 19. So that's less than 1% of that 296. So they're in the 3 to 14 on presentation, they could have an MI, but it's probably less than sort of 1% chance of being an MI. Um, and that's where the clinical kind of decision making comes in about doing repeat enzymes on this population. Remember that 70% of normal patients will have a measurable troponin probably in this range. And in fact, the vast, vast majority of these patients did not have an MI. Now, they may have had some other condition, pulmonary embolism, congestive heart failure, sepsis, being old, uh, unstable angina, maybe something else, maybe that caused a little bit of elevation troponin, but very few of them will actually rule it as an acute MI with myocardial necrosis. So, so Carl, that middle group is actually about 6% that MI. It's not less than 1%, it's yeah. about 6%. 6.6%. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. 19 over 300. Yeah. You're right. My, 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 my decimal is wrong. Thank you, John. That's right. 10% um, would have been 29, right? So, so there is a chance that they'll have an MI. Yeah. Thank you, John. Vipin also highlighted this sort of snout test. This is the high sensitivity troponin for MI is one of those kind of snout tests in the sense that it's very highly sensitive. And we can only use this test to kind of rule out a disease. You can't use it to rule in MI. Um, the example that we're familiar with is the D-dimer for PE in the low-risk population. So if we use somebody with a low risk for PE, we do a D-dimer. If it's negative, you're done. They do not have a PE. You don't have to do any other tests. You don't have to repeat the D-dimer. You don't have to do a VQ. You're done. Um, but if the D-dimer is positive, that doesn't mean they have a PE, right? It doesn't help you. And the high sensitivity troponin for MI is similar in this sense, that if it's negative, if it's less than three, you know, you're probably done for most patients. Unless there's something weird like ECG changes or something in the story that makes you think it's, you know, you're really still concerned, in which case you could do repeats. Carl, that's the whole problem with this whole test, how it's not gonna help emerge at all. Like, because the specificity sucks. 
So before you know, an emerge, we said, okay, I know what to do with the positive troponin. Hello, cardiology. I suspect what's going to happen now is, yes, you're going to get that small percentage that has no positive troponin, you can maybe send them home. But now you've got a positive troponin, now what do I do? I suspect what's going to happen is you're going to now be doing a bunch of cereals, even in your highest group, where this, where, you know, these people who had the highest levels greater than 14, there was a huge percentage that was still ruled out for MI at the end of the day. So, so I suspect what's going to happen is, oh, you do another cradle, say, we'll do another repeat. Oh, well, we'll do another delta. And all of a sudden, we'll be left trying to work up all these people. So I think it's going to end up with more serial um, uh, uh, levels drawn in emerge and, and more confusion about what to do. I so see it. In no way does this help us. In people who were over 14, above the 99th percentile, half of them had MIs. Exactly. So half. 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 Yeah, so you know what? So a mismatch group really sucks. <coughs> Before, and the other one, at least, you know, for the most part, you know, they had an MI by definition. Because their troponins might have been over 14, but low, low below the detectable limit. Remember, the detectable half, limit's 30 here. Yeah. So you would have missed those patients. Now you're catching them. Sure, you've got a problem with how do you then stratify them? Who amongst these truly has an MI? Who doesn't? But in the olden days, well, with the old troponin, you would have missed those individuals potentially. You're not going to call them and say, "Listen, yeah, I know it's 30, but you know, just do another three-hour one. Let's see what the delta changes." Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, okay, yeah, so we're going to talk about, I think that's actually the next topic, we'll talk about that. But, you know, I think in the right clinical setting where you, you actually think the risk is kind of low, we see those patients, you know, once you've heard the history and everything and look at the ECG and you think it's really low and it's less than three, I don't think you have to do repeats. Whereas now I think we're into, oh, we have to keep them for six hours to do a repeat enzyme. I think this and other papers would suggest that if it's less than three, you're probably done with regards to MI, and I keep having to say that because it doesn't mean they don't have some disease that could potentially be serious, but, but um, if they're less than three, you're probably done. So we don't have to do the repeats. We may actually reduce... No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Less than five, yes, we're probably done, but we're going to have a lot. The specificity sucks. So the, yes, yes, yes. the false positive rate is going to be huge, just like the problem we get in with D-dimer. Yes. When we start throwing it around willy-nilly, then all you end up with is a bunch of false positive doing a bunch more testing. Yes. And I suspect what will happen is a lot more people end up going cath lab or stress MIBI or whatever, yes. because we're not really sure what, what it is anymore. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. The delta values will help yeah, out. Yeah, we'll talk about the delta. We have to come up with the good delta values to improve the specificity. Yeah, but your That's slides will show that they need to merge for nine hours. No, 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 Repeats. Yeah. So, so I guess the other question is, sorry, uh, yep. part B is how long does it take for us to get the test? Because I think you know the quicker we get tests and the and the, and the earlier we can detect <laughs> disease, it yeah. will be encroached upon by the amount of time it takes the test to be reported on FirstNet. So if it takes an hour or two to report the test, and you know it's it's only useful or it's u most useful in the first hour or two, then it all of a sudden becomes less useful once again. And as far as the turnaround time for the, for the assay is concerned, the time is exactly the same as uh, our current assay. So it should be so the same as what we currently have. But that's yeah. unfortunate because it is fairly long. It's, uh, it's in our lab, turnaround time is less than one hour, but how long it takes for the sample to go to the lab and that's, uh, yeah. we don't have much control. Precisely. Faster it reaches there and we can, our lab turnaround time, time is one hour. So, Carl, my concern is the opposite of uh, Derek's, which is the person who's got an initial negative troponin, um, the push from cardiology will be uh, those people uh, don't need to be seen for them. But the one case, which I think you kind of alluded to earlier, yep. is the patient with the Wellen syndrome, yep. where you're going to have serial negative troponins. So I think what we need to do is to get an understanding from cardiology residents rotating that uh, the troponin by itself cannot be the uh, be all and end all in certain cases. Yeah, and in fact, that's why I keep appending to my statements for MI. It doesn't, uh, and I'll, sh I'll show you some slides for uh, unstable angina, but that's sort of similar to what we do now, because I certainly, I know, you know, I'm sure everyone else also refers to cardiology cases where the repeat troponins are negative. You know, if you're worried about the story or there's dynamic ECG changes, it doesn't matter what the troponin is. If you're worried that it's an unstable angina, that's still an appropriate referral. And we should not let cardiology, the cardiology residents, talk us out of a referral 
Oh, well, the troponin is less than three. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it is only one test in a whole series yeah. of clinical assessment uh, that one, one does for a patient to, to diagnose MI. And if, if the setting is good, if the chest pain story is good, if the risk factors are present, um, whether there are ECG changes or not, um, if the troponin is negative, but if the story is really good or classic for angina, then it has to be referred to cardiology, I think. You cannot discharge that patient. So it's, it's basically early risk stratification. Yeah. That's what we're doing, and it's one element in that risk stratification process. This also, you know, the, the highest risk group, the ones that, you know, die at home, the ones, you know, that result in the lawsuits, the, the people of higher risk of something bad happening are, in fact, the, the missed AMIs. They're not so much the missed unstable anginas. That is a lower risk group for bad outcomes. We want to pick them up. That is part of our job to pick up those people. But you can argue that this does hopefully get rid of some of the high risk people that we may currently be sending home because our level of detection is low. Um, and I think they showed a couple, or Vipin showed a couple where the, in fact, in our current system, somebody might have sent them home because the repeats were negative. Yeah, Greg? So um, I guess on a positive note, I mean, what I've been doing lately because, you know, I, I don't find this as helpful is that when they do come in with a good, good clinical story, yeah. I'm actually calling cardiology before a troponin yeah. result is back. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way I look at these things is it, it's oftentimes not the troponin is going to make the difference, no matter how sensitive or what the timing delta is. I mean, and, you know, it, to, to their uh, credit, CCU residents have been seeing those patients a lot and getting admitted. And, getting their risk stratification done as an inpatient. That's been my experience as well. Follow. So I, again, I'm not sure how much this troponin is going to help in, in a lot of those scenarios. Thomas? Uh, Carl, you, you mentioned at the start that we, it's a seesaw, and it's the cost of sensitive, sensitivity versus specificity. And, and I'm not convinced that uh, our current system is not is we have a problem with sensitivity. My gut sense is we only miss a couple of percent, one or two percent of MIs. I think that a lot of the people who go home after being seen and have an adverse event are actually that unstable angina category where their tropes were negative. People who have a reasonable story generally get tested and get picked up. And I'm not certain that this is going to improve our sensitivity very much. And I think that should be monitored to see how many missed MIs we're getting or how many because I'm not convinced that that's our problem, sensitivity. I think our problem is resource utilization. And this is going to be, a, I, I, I have the same concerns as Derek. I think either us or cardiology are going to end up keeping more people for longer. Am I just going to fill out? I mean, I totally agree on that. I resist that all the time. I mean, I mean, all the studies of missed MI by eMERGE, it's kind of 2 to 5%. And this was before troponins or any marker. So, you know, our history, our physical, our ECG looking at the patient was, already 95 to 98% sensitive. So why are you throwing in a test, like an old proponent, that at six hours, sensitivity was like 65, 70%. Like it was, to me, it was insane. I agreed with Keith. You know, really, I did it because I wanted to keep them around. Did the chest pain go away? Did they get a recurrence, you know, repeat uh, ECGs? But otherwise, the, the, the rationale for using troponins to me was insane. Why do a six hour enzyme when the sensitivity of a six hour troponin is, is 60 to 70%? It doesn't make sense when your clinical skills were already 95 to 98% sensitive. Uh, and I totally agree. This is going to lead to more cardiology, us fighting with them, them saying, do a delta, them saying, geez, do we cat this guy? Do we not cat this guy? Do we don't have any problem with emergency, but from emergency, mostly we get two or three troponins. Yes. And force. after that, the problem is from the rest of the hospital, yes. from ICU, they are doing patients for five days continuously, two times a day. So they are like 10 to 12. <laughs> Troponins are running in the range of, in the current assay, they are running in the range of 10, 12, 14. They just keep on doing every day. So once a diagnosis is made, troponin should be stopped. So that's why I'm saying that if we do that, follow it, we can cut down actually the troponins. We can't yeah, do Vipin doesn't have any, Vipin doesn't have any uh, bones with the eMERGE department. No. <laughs> well, that's not what he says after three years. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, but I think, we, I really think we should be spending money and effort not on a new assay, but on getting provocative testing within 24 hours, which we can get. I, I'm not, like I think from a, you know, we're lucky. We have a, a whole hospital system that's funded by one payer. We shouldn't be spending money on a new assay that's going to be used more. I think we should be spending money and effort on rapid provocative testing for these people, which we don't have. I, I, I can't disagree with you, but we're getting a new enzyme. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Less stress. That, that's the first thing you missed that point. <laughs>
you know, just to allay the confusion around the early presenter, perhaps if we did, if, if it was early and you were going to do the second one, if we made sure that the second one was at the six hour mark, so if there was some confusion about early, like if you were one, two, because he was saying that, you know, for sure at the three hour mark. But if you did the second, so I don't care when you draw as long as it's a couple hours after the chest pain. But when you draw this, the second one, if it was <coughs> six, would that be helpful? Same word as now. Yeah. No, but the guy was missing the three, we aren't going to miss those early. So we are really early on the curve. Yeah, but you need to do that. If you're, you're doing it at two, and then you're doing it at five, which yeah. is what we just talked about. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And yeah. you're, you're, you've got no delta, or delta's less than 10. Yes, I think yeah. the answer is we're, we're safe to let them go. Guys, we're not going to have to worry about our negative test. It's going to be this crazy number of positive. Well, I, I know, I know. And you're delusional, man. You're going to be doing way more tests. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be doing a million tests. Okay. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. Thank you.